This is a lecture on authentic renewal, unused artillery. Renewal is a matter of essence, not of cosmetics. Hence it is that if that essence is not renewed, any shortcut approach can but lead to more of the same thing. In that context, I would like to examine a few specific areas of often unexplored renewal. The first is that of ministries entrusted willingly to many, but possibly too hastily, and hence easily undertaken and shoddily prepared. In the Synod on the Word, it was widely observed that the quality of the public proclamation of the same was not equal to the dignity demanded by the office. In the interests of maintaining active participation, in practice the deep participation of all but the reader is often all but excluded. Yes, in view of those interests, the entire liturgy of the word prior to the gospel is in practice sacrificed. Hence the first bit of unused artillery that I would examine would be that of the dormant lectorate. The office is as ancient as the church, and its re-evaluation might lead to a rediscovery of the power of the inspired word. Allowed to speak with its own divine voice, unclouded and unobscured by the illness of haste and nervousness. The word needs a pause, that its thrust may be driven home in the calmly dying echo. Public reading, aided or otherwise by means of amplification, cannot be left to improvisation. The Logos deserves better. The second I look at is the equally dormant acolytate. It cannot be denied that the banalization of the culminating moment of encounter between heaven and earth in Holy Communion has profoundly damaged the inner and outer life of the church. It would seem that its relegation to the shortest possible part of the celebration is a reflection of the degree of honour given to her Lord. This is the supreme instant of healing and healing is a matter of depth. A short cut to it will have an equally short-lived effect. Again, in the interests of maximum participation, participation on a deeper level is damaged. It can be legitimately asked whether the intuitions given to the church in the council ears were sufficiently unpackaged. The dignity of a duly instituted minister clad in sacred garb and 
assisting at the altar throughout the celebration is one thing. The casualness of a member of the congregation clad in whatever it might not be and making a bolt from the pew to the tabernacle is another. The third element to be examined would be that of the diaconate. When a person receives the character of the third degree of order, that person enters into the mystery of the power of the Blessed Trinity, which can but be a source of new grace for those to be touched by him. A specialization in the ministry of preaching is an immense blessing for an area. So too is the presence of one able to enhance the liturgy by the expression of its fullness. For my part, I am persuaded that any genuinely fervent parish is well able to call forth one or two deacons from its excellent men. These would be the ordinary ministers of Holy Communion. And a damper on the onslaught of over-anxious helpers from the pews. Which brings me to the fourth element. The same willing helpers might be genuinely helpful if another often ignored ministry were proposed to them. It is the often dormant one of canter, either individual or teamed. The animation of the liturgy is a huge help to the celebrant and people and is a genuine means of making such culminating moments as Holy Communion, as healing as, say, the gentlest session of an authentic charismatic group who are well able to create unhurried beauty and calm. The human person is a psychosomatic being and the action of grace is aided by the contribution of nature. Music ministries are open to the many competent girls and ladies that could, if encouraged, greatly enhance our encounters with the Lord of Beauty. In this context, it is to be remembered that of its nature, a psalm is a song and needs to be treated as such. So too is the gospel acclamation and any other similar acclamation. Indeed, one of the veritable unexploded arsenals of liturgical renewal, as envisaged by the liturgical movement, was the invitation to have some elements of singing in every celebration. Linking thus the West to the calmer and more melodic East, the essence of whose liturgical life is not, it would seem, haste.
But the fifth area I would like to mention is of a different order. It is that of choice of state, largely as yet unpacked. The valid alternative of a renewed but very ancient form of consecration needs to be revisited. There are compelling reasons for this. In our day, many young persons, girls in particular, are discouraged from giving themselves purely to the Divine Bridegroom for the simple reason that the weight of years that burden existing religious communities makes it simply unfair to ask a young person to shoulder it. The potential of the dynamic of Canon 604 is not sufficiently noticed. Nor is the veritable bomb almost entirely unexploded in the second paragraph of this same canon. This provides for the case of a group of virgins who would like to share this consecration by opting to live together. The freshness of such an experience is something else. And much beauty can emerge from a house of young lovers of the Lord. We forget that the Ordo Virginum is the most ancient order of all in the history of religious life. And we have the testimony of ancient mosaics bearing witness to its antiquity, e.g. that of the conferring of the veil by St. Ambrose to his sister Marcella. The last two arsenals that I'd indicate are similarly two that regard life choices. The first concerns the orientation of a consecration already made, in this case through sacred ordination. In my doctoral thesis, I explored one specific angle on this from a historical perspective, namely that of the power that comes and has ever come from the collocation of several souls that bear the priestly seal in one place. The study regarded the specific dynamics of the movement of Canons Regular, but its conclusion ran thus. As in past centuries, the power of witness and support and liturgical praise was safeguarded by the sharing of the gift of the priesthood. So in our day, immense benefits would accrue to the church from the exploration of the element of communion often unexplored by priestly souls in the option of shared life. With a simple model, based not on prelature amongst them, but on the prelature of the bishop, father of their priesthood. In this respect, I made appeal to the model of canonical life that revolved around St. Eve of Chartres. In a sense, the intuition was taken up very successfully by
by the great Philip Neri, and after him by blessed John Henry Newman. When brethren are gathered together, things begin to happen. A huge force of radiation at times is emitted from a small group of men that bear the sacerdotal seal and share its joy and power in openness to the God of surprises. Finally, I would mention the significance of the often forgotten time bomb next to the earlier mentioned canon. Canon 603 provides for the case of a soul desirous of authentic contemplative life, but not necessarily called to shoulder with it an entire community. A great benefit can be found in the very simple life of pure verticality. A hermit has but one centre of attention. And the one-to-one -one of life before the tabernacle is a way unto him that might merit greater attention. To conclude, the key figure in all these cases mentioned is ultimately the bishop. One observes how an open and listening Episcopal ear traps many a passing grace, while another administers so well that the Lord himself is not spotted. As St. Augustine put it, Timeo Dominum Transiuntem. I'm afraid of the law of passing by. In the case of our priestly community in Italy, Sant'Antimo, our brethren came to colonize the empty abbey all through the vision and energy of one man who became a father to the band, the auxiliary bishop of Siena, who went to France to seek out and find a band of men of prayer. So too, my own coming to Aaron, initially on loan, then to stay as a quiet presence in a place already hallowed by centuries of prayer, was entirely due to one open ear and heart, that of the Bishop of Me. The very same that similarly acquired three other souls of contemplative prayer, lady hermits, and a small community of Benedictines, as it happens just beside me. Looking further afield, one observes similar phenomena on the ecclesiastical horizon. In the Diocese of Toulon, no fewer than 50 communities have been welcomed by the listening bishop. One wonders at times whether some pastors exercise the gift of prudence so well that they prudently avoid the risk of something new. Much prudential wisdom might yet perhaps be excavated from an old French adage. Qui ne risque rien n'a rien. And so it is that we have 
and are happy to have. More of the same thing.